Hello, Moto America fans, and welcome to this latest edition of Off Track with Carruthers and Bice. I am Bice, and I am in central Ohio, and I'm with my counterpart, Paul Carruthers, communications manager for Moto America, and he's in Southern California. Um, and I don't know if you can hear faintly in the background, but uh, we're doing this at noon on Wednesday, which means in the little town I live in, there's a siren that goes off to let you know that it's noon. So anyway, if you hear that in the background, I apologize. But um, Paul, hey, uh, how are you doing? One more uh, next week. It's Thanksgiving. Can you believe it? Yeah, it's, it's, it, time flies. It seems like we were just at the last race and it actually seems like it was just August. And then all of a sudden here we are. But uh, yeah, it's always nice to uh, get into the holiday season and and uh you know gain a little more weight like we need that right <laughs> yeah yeah i mean what's what's i've always wondered with these holidays that come up that are so seasonal and and the time the time of year and the weather in areas where you get four seasons is it's so you know you know thanksgiving's coming it just feels that way or obviously christmas what's it like with you guys i mean with the fact that the climate doesn't really change all that much do you do you get any changes that give you a sense of thanksgiving coming up no <laughs> exactly you gotta watch the calendar right it's funny it's uh it's actually like i would consider today gloomy uh -huh. And I haven't, I haven't been outside yet, but it's probably like 68 degrees and I'll probably get to like 74, but it's, it's kind of odd. Sometimes our, to me, the win the nice days in winter, are like the nicest days we have, cause it's like crystal clear and you know, there's no crowds and, and the beach is pristine and it's, uh, it's kind of just got a different feel to it than, than the summer does. And yeah. like we, you know what, you can guarantee like January 1st, when they have the Rose Bowl, that it's the most beautiful day of the year. And then, you know, the next week, everybody tries to move here. So it's, <laughs> it's always like that for the Rose Bowl. I don't think I've ever seen a Rose Bowl that wasn't just perfect, picture perfect. It's true. Weather. It's true. Especially in our areas where the weather's not so good, you get up on that morning and you watch that thing and you're like, oh my God, it's so nice there. So, um, but uh, hey, speaking of which, so we've got uh, an, another uh, person from at least the Eastern time zone, East Coast more than I'm, I am here in Ohio. Um, and it's uh, Ed Sullivan, who's crew chief for Westby Racing, longtime crew chief for the team, has been involved with that team for a long time. And he's got a pretty rich history of things that he's involved in, whether it's, um, you know, uh, he actually is a rider as well. Um, and he does uh, quite a bit with race cars too. So, you know, I'm going to read this um, excerpt or this, this sort of profile of Ed that's on the Westby Racing um, website. And one of the reasons I'm going to read it is because I wrote it. So <laughs> anyway, so it, yeah. so it says the riders and crews go to man with a plan. Ed is responsible for making sure the motorcycles, riders and crew all deliver peak performance. An accomplished technician, as well as a bit of a shaman, Ed is as adept at reading fuel maps as he is at understanding the mind of a road racer, because he is a road racer. Ed works closely with the team manager, suspension specialist, electronic specialist technicians, and riders to create the optimal bike setup for each track on the schedule, as well as the prevailing conditions. He also manages the riders and crew schedules through the race weekends. And the other thing about Ed, let me just tell you, um, he's British and I've used every Ed Sullivan show joke on the guy it's from Topo Gigio to, you know, balancing plates. And for people of a certain age that know what I'm talking about, that doesn't mean anything to Ed because he's a British guy. So, um, but let's bring him in. Ed, how are you this morning? Yeah, good. Thanks guys. Appreciate you, uh, you having me on. Um, I haven't read that Sean on the, on the website. So, uh, that sounds like a lot to live up to. Um, and maybe uh, uh, maybe a little bit optimistic me doing all those tasks, but I appreciate the uh, the rundown. You know, it's funny. We've talked to a few uh, uh, crew chiefs, and they're all pretty humble, you included. I mean, the most recent one we spoke to was John Cornwell, who uh, was interesting because he was on this on Westby Racing as a, the suspension guy with Olins, and you know, um, and and he you worked with him. So, uh, you know, I, I'm sure you missed having him on the team, but you probably, you know, sort of understood it from working with him. Um, was it, first thing I want to ask you straight out, and this is a little out, 
out, out there, I think. But I used to watch Cornwell talk to Matthew quite a bit. And I've always felt like, hey, as long as the crew chief is talking, all eyes on him, don't don't have anybody else talk to him. But the dynamic within Westby Racing is interesting. Of course, you got the high spirited Chuck Giacchetto as well. So it's got to be kind of interesting for you because you have a pretty quiet but stern, not stern, but serious demeanor about what you're doing. And you have to kind of juggle some of these personalities as well as people trying to get in Matthew's face when he comes off the track. But you're the you're the one that manages it. So how does that work? Um, well, yeah, I think that's uh, the role that is probably not understood the most with a crew chief is, is managing the people. Um, you know, it's not all about the technical side. It's um, trying to get all these personalities that are often very strong. Um, this attracts those kind of personalities. So you've got to make the whole thing kind of work uh, and, and mainly keep the rider calm and focused, you know. so. Uh, I think with John talking to the rider so much when he was with us, I was comfortable doing it. John was with us since 2015, you know, and I was super green as a crew chief then. Um, and he really, um, you know, gave us a step up. Um, so one of his big strengths, maybe even bigger than his suspension knowledge is, is, you know, he was a high level rider. He rode Grand Prix. Um, yep. So, uh, just just his his mannerisms with the rider he knows what they're feeling and um so i was always comfortable with him uh talking to matthew um obviously you know i knew what he was talking about and um was always involved in the conversation but uh, maybe him more than anybody else i'd be comfortable uh talking to matthew um but yeah but you know there's a lot of uh, personalities and, and you need to sort of try to embrace the strengths of those personalities um and not dumb them down uh, but channel them in, in a positive way. And that, that kind of takes time. And uh, I think, you know, we're on a pretty good path right now. Um, but yeah, John, John, you know, he joined us in 2015. And uh, obviously, as you guys know, that was pretty, pretty dark days for us. Um, and his role was more than technical, more than suspension. It was trying to keep everybody going um, right. when we could have all packed it in quite easily back then, you know, so uh, you know, he's a friend of our team. He's certainly a friend of mine. And um, yeah, we owe him a lot. But, um, you know, now he's gone too far with uh, with Jake and winning all these races. So uh, we're going to have to <laughs> try and, try and uh, snare him back somehow. But um, yeah, good guy. Good guy. Well, Ed, you guys finished second in the Moto America Superbike Championship, which is pretty damn good. You were the best of the rest, so to speak, and you finished second to what is probably inarguably the, the best team in, in the paddock. Is, mm -hmm. that, is that enough for you at this point? I mean, how, how, how close are you to taking the next step and, and what do you think that next step would be to get even closer to, to, to those guys that attack? Um, so the first part of the question um, is second good enough? No, I, I don't think it's good enough for anybody. Um, you know, it, it's uh, it's good, you know, you, on the face of it, we're a private team. Um, you know, we build the bike ourselves. Um, you know, there's lots of parts that we design and um, put on the bike, but um, ultimately we're there to win. And if we believe we're capable of doing it, um, second is, is not good enough. And it's really the mannerism of the second it wasn't like we won one then jake won then we you know jake got hold of that thing and, and disappeared you know so no it's not good enough um yes we we've got to take the positives as well um but you know we we feel if you look at it over two seasons with with cameron and matthew we were making you know some good progression there until matthew got hurt and he sat on the couch for a long time over the winter you know, we're a one bike team and it's everything stops with development. You know, you can't get the rider on the bike. Um, you know, we didn't do much testing over over the off season. And then once you get to racing, it's it's really hard on a race weekend to, to you know, put um, too many different things on the bike. Um, you know, so the forward progression was good, but yeah, we, we, we just lost it in the winter, I feel. I think towards the end of the year, we were really strong, really strong. So 
you know, uh, over the, it's winter, we've got a good um, development plan. And um, yeah, next year, we, we can't, we can't have the same. I'm not saying we're going to come and win. But um, it needs to be a closer, a closer fight than this year. You know, I know, I know Matthew's capable. I know the uh, the team's capable. So um, you know, there's no excuses. Obviously, anything can happen in racing, and it does. But um, yeah, yeah, we, we want to win the championship next year. You know. You know, Ed. Let's talk about this year because you know you're right. You pointed out about how it was with with Matthew and his injury, and I. I can't tell you how many times for some reason it slips my mind just because you see him walking around and he's a, he's a fast healer, but that was a terrible injury and crash that he had last year. And it put you guys on your back foot a little bit in terms of the off season with testing. But then this year, one of the things that I don't know that people realize um, is Matthew, of course, he started off the season with a win and he was number one in the championship and he never dropped below second the entire year. Although there were times there from what I can understand within that team where there was some concern about that. And you guys had kind of some struggles a little bit, and there was a bit of a turning point at some point in the season. Um, as much as you can talk about that, can you, can you kind of explain that for the fans who maybe don't, you know, it, it wasn't all necessarily sweetness in life and it light and it never is with any team. There's a lot that has to go into a season to, to maintain that kind of consistency. And, and really it was Matthew's best season ever. So can you talk about how this season sort of progressed? Yeah, sure. So, you know, Matthew came back from South Africa. Um, <laughs> we went and did a quick test at Red Atlanta and I was like, okay, Matt, just, just go and do two, three laps, come in, you know, see how it is. Of course he goes out, boom, straight down to the lap time. Like he'd not been off the bike, you know? So we're like, okay, well, this is this is good. This is good. You know, we went to the Cota test. We were really fast. Um, you know, we made some changes based on that Cota test. And, you know, looking back, maybe that was probably a mistake. We we hadn't raced there the year before. We weren't going to race there, um, you know, that year. Um, so roll into Road Atlanta. And, uh, yeah, really good. You know, obviously, Jake blew up that first race. But, you know, we, we drafted by the Ducati. You know, the bike was quick. Um, Matthew won a race. Um, obviously, Jake won the next one. We went to Virginia. Uh, we were really strong, but just some bits started to creep in, you know. Um, so, not panic stations, but okay. Maybe we're not. Maybe we're not where we think we are right now, you know. Um, and then we went to Road America and definitely had a bit of a nightmare. There were some um, organisational issues with with engine spec and, you know, it sent the rider a little bit. Uh, we then went and tested at Brainard and we, we were really strong and Matthew's confidence was really coming back. Um, and then we went to the Ridge and had another nightmare. Um, so at that point, you've really got to, you can't have a knee jerk reaction. You've really got to sit down. You've got to go through the data. You've got to ask yourself, you know, some pretty hard questions. And so is the rider. Uh, and that, could have been it for us. We could have driven ourselves right into the floor after um, after the ridge, you know. Um, but we had um, we had a good reset. Matthew and I had quite a few heart to hearts about um, not just the bike, but the way that he rides the bike when he gets um, a little bit behind in terms of um, you know the lap time, how he tries to react to that, and it's hard to um, it's hard to uh, criticize him for that because he's he's trying harder and, and a lot of the time he needs to just calm down a little bit you know he, he tends to charge the corner if he wants to go faster and uh, so anyway we had a big reset we um we did go back and forth a little bit with um with Richard at attack and he was pretty helpful with a few few um settings for um um gear shifts and a little bit of advice and we went to Laguna and we kind of steadied the ship, you know, um, gave Matthew some confidence. And um, that really was the turnaround for our, our season to kind of turn it back to an upward trajectory, you know. Um, and then, um, you know, after that, it just got better and better and better and better. And then when you start building the confidence in the rider like that, you, you know, especially Matthew, I still don't know where he's going to, I don't know his potential. You know what I mean? I, I know 
that he could win that championship. And I know that we haven't seen his full potential. But once he gets that confidence going, like Jake did this year, um, you know, he, he's a championship guy for sure. So, um, yeah, it, it definitely was um, a season where the, the middle was was very difficult for us. But um, I think that says a lot about the team, a lot about the rider um, to be able to actually turn that round and, and, and you know, end up the strongest um the strongest of, of everybody else honestly so um yeah yeah we need to we need to really look at that though and that's what a lot of the off season is is to, okay really figuring out the why as to what happened you know it's easy to jump to a conclusion um but to move forward you need to find out why and then you can make the, the changes for next year because you, you know to win this championship you can't have a bad track you know you need to be strong everywhere we go um you know because jake will be i'm sure whoever's on the ducati will be whoever's on the suzuki will be you know so uh yeah the work never stops but um i'm pretty proud of um the reaction to the uh to the to the mid-season uh kind of low well you know ed it's it's interesting to hear you talk about matthew because you know he's he's obviously the longest tenured rider with any one team in Moto America. And it's, it's Westby. Of course, he's been with him forever on, on a Yamaha for a long time. And I, what I always wonder about things like complacency or upside. And you say he hasn't kind of reached his, his full potential yet. So there's still upside with him. Um, and obviously some of that upside would be winning the championship, but how does it work? with it's got to be good to have a familiarity and an understanding of a rider who you've been with for a long time but I mean this is a terrible thing to say and I don't mean to say this about Matthew but you know there's that old adage about familiarity breeds contempt <laughs> and I always wonder about you know um I tend to I've been married a long time I'll, everything I love I've loved for a long time and I just cherish that so I don't really get I don't really get that way about things. I just, you know, becomes a part of who I am, but it's gotta be tough because, you know, you guys are looking for challenges, but there, it sounds like with you, there's still a challenge with Matthew and with him himself and with you with Matthew to get him even more there is, is that you haven't reached that yet, I guess that, that end, right? No, I don't feel we, we have, I think we see flashes of it. I think, um, you know, Brainard onwards this year he was he was back to where he was in 2020 you know i think that it took that long honestly to be um back from the injury uh, and, and you know in the in the mindset where he can do that whole race no mistakes full gas you know um so yeah you know he has been with us a long time um you know it was at road america in 2016 and and uh, josh day had, had got hurt i don't know if you guys remember mm -hmm. uh, he had an awful crash and we ended up not racing so another team had um had an injured rider and they drafted in matthew so trig and i went off different directions of road america watched the race came back and we're like who was that guy who was that <laughs> so, oh wow <laughs> uh, you know we, we managed to get him on the team. So I think that's a big thing for Trigg. You know, we, we've, we spotted him. Uh, so, you know, it wasn't like he was presented to us. We, we saw him. We wanted him. Um, he brought this team a, a championship, you know, and that meant um, that means a lot to, to Westby. Um, you know, it kind of validates somewhat Trigg's um, you know, passion and investment in this team. So, um, yeah, he has been with us a long time. You know, in soccer, you know, you bring in a new manager sometimes and and, and it, you get that big hit. And it's the same with, with racing, you know. A lot of the time, the, the, uh, the first season is the best one. And then it kind of, like you say, there's a bit of complacency, it tails off. And, um, yeah, I do think, though, that right now we've got everything we need. There's no excuses now. So um, I'm not saying Matthew's looking for an excuse. He, he's, he's ready to get it done as well. Um, 
that I, I think he's fully motivated. I think the team's fully motivated and uh, I don't think there's any complacency. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure of that, you know. Okay, so Ed, let's let's pretend we're in a perfect world here and, and there's no costs or the, the costs are taken care of and we don't have to worry about costs. Is having a teammate overrated in your opinion or do you think the team could benefit from having a, another top level super bike rider? And again, that, you know, that, push aside the cost of anything like that and, and whether it's possible or not, but would it actually help or do you think it's overrated? No, I think it would help, you know, obviously depending on who that guy is. Um, but yeah, it, it's the resources to do that properly. That obviously is the problem, but yeah, in your, in your perfect world, um, you can get so much more development work done. Obviously each guy is going to want something slightly different, but um, you can, you can get through a lot of work in testing with two guys um, you know, and, and even in a race weekend. So, um, yeah, it would be good, but, you know, we're almost in a perfect world. Um, but for us to to step up and do the two riders resource-wise, it, it's probably too much at the minute, you know. Um, something for the future we'd like to do. Um, you know, really being able to use two bikes for a one-bike team on a weekend would be really useful. You know, just being able to set one bike up with, with alternate settings so you don't have to change the same bike. You can get through a lot of work doing that. And maybe that's something uh, we should start lobbying for. I'm sure I'm sure Ducati would like that as well, you know. So maybe the disadvantage of the um the one rider team might be um might be slightly less with that, but you know we we don't have any excuses. We've got everything we need to win. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, where we're at and, um, we're, we're pretty happy with our position, you know, what's the, tell us a little bit about the dynamic that you have, um, with, with, uh, Matthew, T you know, I, I guess I want to equate it to when we've talked to Rick Hobbs, when he was crew chief for Cameron, <laughs> excuse me, we would see him come in, uh, Cameron come in and he would, there would be some kind of almost like an un- a communication that was almost like a, a wavelength kind of thing. And I see a lot of times Matthew come in and you guys sit on the wall and you're, you're listening to him. He's talking, or you walk by your paddock area and you see Matthew way in the back of the closer to the truck. Um, and you guys have the monitors in front of you and you're sitting with him and you're kind of going over things. So is he a real analytical writer? Does he talk about clicks and settings or does he talk about, well, it feels like this, or I need more of that. Is it something where you have to understand his body language or his language, or does he flat out give it to you empirically a little bit? How does that work, Ed? Yeah, so, you know, I've been working with Matthew, you know, a long time now. So I know as soon as he steps off that bike, I know what he's feeling. I know what the down, how the download's going to go, you know. So when we're sitting on the wall during the, during the session, you know, as soon as he lifts up his visor, I... You know, I can tell the, um, you know, um, how much uh, kind of an anxiety he has or he hasn't got, you know, just from his eyes, from his body language. So, you know, that kind of sets the tone. And then, yeah, obviously I'm listening to what he's saying. I'm looking at his hands, you know, if he's going through the corner and he's got his hands high, low, you know, all these things are, are, are all... It's not just the actual language from his mouth that we we're looking for, you know. Um, but yeah, for sure, he doesn't say, "I need a click of rebound," "I need mm -hmm. a stiffer spring." He he just tells us what the bike's doing, and that's what we want him to do. We do, we don't need him to. Um, he, you know, <laughs> yeah, but I'll be honest with you. He he really does um, give us good feedback. He knows what's going on with the bike, but um, I don't think he would know the difference between a, a fork spring and a shock spring. And that's fine, you know. His his job's to ride the bike, and he does that well. And he lets us know what's what's going on with him, you know. Um, and then yeah, back at the uh, back at the garage, if we're under under the awning, he's um, hopefully calmed down a little bit by then. But uh, we do show him through the data. Um, we try not to get him too involved in it. Um, he has been too involved in the past, and you know, again, he just needs to have a clear mind. Doesn't need to be thinking about squiggly lines when he's going round, but um, he knows enough about it that he can kind of pinpoint some problems for us in, in areas. So 
we do involve him with the the data a little bit and he's he's pretty good with that um and then we have you know a rider pages and we can show him from years previous or sessions previous what he was doing differently or better or worse and so yeah he's, he's involved in it obviously you know top riders need to need to put the time in to um to help make the bike better we're not just doing it off data we're doing it off their feedback so um he, he plays an important role of the development of the bike you know hmm. all right so tell me this much is it better to have a rider who thinks he knows things and doesn't or is it better to have a rider that knows he knows nothing does that make yeah. sense <laughs> yes no 100 percent better to have a rider that knows he knows nothing <laughs> you know <laughs> but but all, all the all the you know i've been very lucky with um with my career with the riders i've worked with and some of them are um you know very analytical and some of them aren't but they can all read you know go back around the track and tell you exactly what was going on with the bike you know they might not be able to tell you what can fix it they just can tell you the feeling so they all have that ability to recount the the session and, and the laps you know Ed, i want to talk to you about you so well i'm going to give you a, a kind of a complex question here because you're you're a complex thinking guy so um at the top i pointed out the fact that you you are a racer and you ride you you compete in the daytona 200 you you were at Daytona in October because I mean you live in you live in Atlanta, the Atlanta area, so going to Daytona is not too bad for you. And and uh, you ride and have raced here uh, for a long time. And do do you think first of all do you think well let me ask you this and I'm going to follow up after you give me the answer to this. But do you think it helps a crew chief to helps for a crew chief to also have been a racer or currently a racer? Do you ever say does it help you to understand what Matthew's saying? I guess better. Um, yes, it helps me, you know, and I think um, we go back to John Cornwell, I'm sure it helps him. Yep. You know, that's, that's the reference that we have. Um, you know, John was definitely you know, a better rider than I, than I ever been, but, you know, it, it's still the reference for when they're telling you the issues. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I kind of need that reference um, to, to, you know, to kind of navigate the issues but having said that there's a lot of top level engineers who maybe have never sat on a bike you know and with that comes um you know I you could almost be sympathetic to the rider if you ride yourself because you can understand how difficult something could be but if you haven't done it and it's just black and white this is what you need to do this is what I want to see um you know you, you can understand that angle as well so I think um, bike racing is interesting um, as opposed to car racing. The engineers in bike racing tend to have ridden themselves. You know, we're trying to we're trying to measure feeling, you know, and, and that helps when you've ridden yourself um, with a car. It's it's a lot about aerodynamics, you know, setting the floor. So maybe you give you, you set the car up and maybe you give five percent to what the driver's feeling to tailor it to him. And, and this is, you know, obviously I'm not being engineering cars, but just, you know, having knowledge of the, the car world. Whereas, you know, there was plenty of times where there was three Yamahas on the podium this year, all completely different. Because the rider just plays such a such a big role in how that bike handles. Um, so I think, you know, that's a, a big difference with car racing and bike racing um, is, is the feel aspect. So yeah, for sure, it helps me. If if I hadn't have ridden up, it, it'd be very difficult for me to do to do my job. I think. Well, let me ask you this too, and I know you're going to answer this with humility, um, but I kind of don't want you to. I want you to answer this like a rider. Um, and so, does Matthew do stuff on the track that you you look at and go, "Oh my God, I couldn't do that." Do you do you do you see that? Yeah, it's really frustrating, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I can ride, I can, you know, pretty good. But uh, these yeah. guys, they can, they can just, they get to a track and they can just get down to the times so fast, you know. Um, 
yeah, I'm constantly impressed, and I, I've been lucky with with all the guys that I've worked with. But um, yeah, for sure, he's always doing stuff that's you know I've I've ridden the, I've ridden the Westby bike. I've you know lucky enough to ride a an R1 with the um, with N2 for the uh, the endurance series that they put on with Weira. And it's just yeah, those guys are just a different level, you know. So um, it, it's really you know a pleasure to to work with that high level rider because you know that what you're going to get is is what the bike has you know and there's no particular room for oh well you know just can't quite get this done or that done that's what the bike's got you know these guys you can plug plug any of the top guys in our series into the world championship as as you've seen with garrett and and cameron um you know baz came over and um you know our guys showed pretty strong against him and and it's it's really a you know a, a high mark for me to be able to work with these guys that can do these these things on motorcycles but i can't tell you matt i can't tell matthew that too much because uh he'll get a big head <laughs> yeah i get you did did uh he, it was earlier it was early days for dane westby but did from what you could tell did dane did dane have that that intangible about he's got that other he had that other level Oh yeah, yeah for sure, for sure. So I work I worked with Dane um, as a, as a tech in 2010, and and Chuck was the crew chief actually. So um, I think 2010 really Dane it was you know Super Sport 600, and um, he went from a guy with some potential to being a, a consistent front runner. You know, uh, so I got to see that that was good, and then. Uh, when I started working with him again, I just did one race at the end of um, 14 when he when he doubled. Uh, um, we well, didn't double, so he he um, ran away with race one at New Jersey in a monsoon. <laughs> uh, and then I came back after that. Um, we did the test at Cota on a super stock bike, and uh, as soon as he got on the thing, he was blazing. He was up with with Josh Hayes, and um, you know. It, world was at his feet so for sure he, he had everything he needed um but he had more than that as well you know so yeah you could, you could definitely see that with him and so much upside there but okay let's 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 talk about this year's 200 because you were in the 200 last year you, uh, are you going to race this year's 200 with the changes given the changes that are going on in super sport and uh well let just flat out are you gonna are you gonna do it what else is going on with you at daytona um yes <laughs> i'll be riding something at daytona so um i've got to talk to my my guys and um, it was really cool actually last year uh, i sort of reconnected with um some friends that when i first came over here we we, we did track days together down at jennings in florida <clears throat> and we sort of reconnected and they wanted to put a bike in the 200 i had a bike they had um you know the the uh, the ability to get people down there and uh, put a team together. So so we went and did it. It was great. Um, ended up a little bit disappointed. Honestly, didn't really meet what I felt was my potential. But um, anyway, whatever. Uh, <laughs> we did finish. Um, so yeah, I got to get with those guys, see what they want to do, um, and and talk about you know where we want to upgrade the six hundred. Um, yeah, not really sure at the minute. I mean, you know, mine's on on other things, honestly. Um, and there's also a chance I might ride a, a twins bike. I think. Uh, oh wow! Um, I really like the the new R7. Um, I think Daytona's a you know it would be a one and done for me, obviously, because um, you know the super bikes aren't there. Um, but I think to get a bike around Daytona takes um, you know a certain uh, approach. And uh, I think you know Chuck's involved with the development of the uh, Chuck Chiquetta is involved with the development of the R7, and I think um, that would be an in interesting project, you know. And I, yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to ride one. So yeah, I will be on something. Um, I haven't seen a schedule, and I'm not right. sure if I've got it in me to do everything. But maybe I'll just do the 200 and the twins. We'll see. We'll see. Okay. Okay, so you're at, Day you're at Daytona and you pull into pit road and you ride down to your pit. Do you get off the bike and talk to yourself and then get back on the bike? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I need a word with myself, honestly. Okay. Yeah. And are you yeah. the guy that's smart enough to know he knows nothing? Yes, exactly right. 
exactly right. So with with uh, with with me, uh, you know, it, it's more about the the riding technique. So I, I don't really, if I get sucked into looking at the data on my bike and the settings, and it's hard for me to get out of that mode and then jump on the bike. Right. You know, so I almost need to just get on and ride because right. that's what that's where where most of my gains are going to come from. So. Um, you know, a lot of the time we've been testing with Matthew and someone said, oh, go and ride this or ride that. I never do it because I'm either in crew chief mode or in rider mode. And, and I can't, it's hard for me to go switch gears, honestly. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. I do. My dad would always tell me, like, when you get to within a half a second, then we'll talk about the, <laughs> talk about the bike. Exactly. Exactly. Bottom yeah. line is, you probably just need to go ride. Yeah, I just, you know, I get, I do get, you know, a decent amount of chance to to ride, but you know, these these other guys are they're riding every couple of weeks. It's hard then to jump in, you know, having been the other side of the wall and get straight up to speed, you know. So um, it it takes me a little while. I think if they if they do the Daytona race on the Monday, I'll be right there. But. <laughs> Hey, Ed, one of the things I've talked about on this podcast uh, a fair amount is, you know, I mean, we all love motorcycles. I've got motorcycles in my garage. Sometimes I almost don't have to ride them to love them. I'll go out in my garage and I'll just sit there and stare at them. And I do that a lot in the paddock. I mean, I'll stop in at Westby Racing and just stand there and stare at Matthew's bike. And, you know, I'll always see all kinds of cool things on it. You know, the, the fasteners, the use of titanium and carbon fiber. And that leads to you a little bit. You've got some components on there that, as I understand it, were developed by you and it also comes from your uh background or your your current uh situation with car racing and can you tell the fans about that because i don't i don't know that a lot of fans within our paddock really know that what you do with four wheel stuff so um tell us about it yeah so i mean i came over here um i worked for a, a manufacturer of an indy car um so in 2000, um, it was called G-Force, um, Montoya won Indy in 2000. Um, so I've been involved in, in car racing for you know, a long time. And obviously composites is um, a big aspect of, of how, they're, how they're built. So yeah, came over, um, was always in cars, you know, Le Mans 24 hour, this and the other, um, but always really was a biker, you know? Um, so, yeah, my my primary business uh, since '06 has been a, a, a composite shop dealing with race car parts. Um, so then, you know, the R1 came out in '15, and I don't know if you remember, but they wanted to get the super stock bikes a bit closer to the super bike. So they, mm -hmm. it was kind of like a super stock plus, if you like. They gave us clamps. There was quite a few bits that were um, were open. So, you know, one of the things with the super stock bike was um, the fuel tank was too small. So we needed a bigger tank. So where we wanted to put the fuel, it didn't fit, sit, sit in the subframe. So I made a carbon subframe. So that's on the bike. Um, I didn't like the shape of the tank. So I reshaped the tank with, a, with a, an extender on the back. Um, and then, you know, people started asking to buy the things. And at first we were like, no, you can't buy it. It's for, you know, it's for Josh Day, <laughs> uh, but, but sort of relented after that. And yeah, we made, we made hundreds of things. And uh, so there's been some crossover with it, really. But, you know, with car racing, um, if you don't have a part, there tends to be a bit more resources, but you, you just tend to make it, you know. And I think um, obviously Richard over at Attack is of that mindset. Um, I think we are to a point as well um but yeah that's that's been my 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 primary business um since 06 um and then um two years ago um i partnered uh, with a friend of mine ben cooper and uh we started producing um a race car um it's called sebeco motorsport and um yeah that's just taken off taken off like crazy um so yeah, um, no one knows what it is, but if you Google uh, or YouTube uh, NPO1, John McGuinness, 
you can see him here in round Donington in one of our cars. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a cool uh, a cool business. Um, but honestly, you know, my heart is with the bikes, and um, yeah, that's where I kind of see my my future really. In your in your business, what what part? Is, so do you do you do the design, the CAD CAM, the fabrication? I mean, what part of it are you involved in? <clears throat> well, the whole car is 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 owned by us. So um, we my my role really here primarily is is actually putting the cars together. Um, so we've redesigned parts of the car. Um, Ben's done a lot. Ben was um, Williams F1 aero department. So, um, you know, there's been a lot of aero tweaks on the car and that, they've really come from Ben. Um, so, yeah, my role has really been putting the cars together, um, you know, handling some of the business side of it. But um, with with my Westby commitments, a lot of it's, you know, been left to Ben. And um, yeah, he's done a done an amazing job, honestly. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, we just uh, rented a, 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 a new unit. So the cars are gonna um, come down here and um, the original workshop will, will stay open as well with SE Composites and uh, I'll slide some bikes through there if possible. Wow, that's amazing. You know, that's a part of you, Ed, that I mean, few know about, at least at least in our paddock. I know you have a relationship with Perry Melnichuk that goes way back too. and. Perry's yeah. been involved in IndyCar and stuff too. Um, yeah. I understand it to 500. He was basically pulling, I shouldn't say only, but he was pulling the tear offs off the, the windshield for the winning car. So um, yeah. you guys have been involved that way. Um, but we're going to wrap here, but I want to ask you one other question since you mentioned Arrow. This is coming out of nowhere. I didn't plan to ask you this, but this Arrow movement that's going on in MotoGP with these fins and wings and all that kind of stuff, is that just show or does that stuff really work? Um, well, they're making it work. They're making it work for sure, you know. Um, I think the Ducati, you know, on the exterior is closest to a to a Formula One car, you know. They're, they're definitely not look, get, going for uh, aesthetics, are they? Um, no. no. So, <laughs> um, yeah, no, it, it, it does seem to work. It's something, though, that takes a lot of development. Um, it's difficult on a bike because of the way that you know the riders influence the the airflow the, the way that the bike moves around um you know with a with a car uh, in an ideal situation you keep the the floor as flat as possible you know everything trying to keep it consistent so that's difficult with a bike um but yeah they're making it work um so i don't think it's for show okay well we're going to wrap here uh because well one of the reasons is Ed does have a, a business that he runs and this is his lunch hour. So we, we pretty much used all of his lunch hours. So Ed, thank you so much for being on and give us some insights into Westby racing and what it's like to crew chief and also uh, some of the other fascinating things you do, including racing yourself. So look for Ed Sullivan in the Daytona 200 and possibly also twins cup in our first round this year. And, and uh, you know, thanks so much for being on with us, Ed. Yeah, no worries. Just quickly guys, just want to, yeah, give a mention to you know the, the team and, and Trig in particular for for keeping going with this. You know, um, we've definitely had our ups and downs, and um, you know everyone on the team appreciates uh, what he does for us. Um, obviously, there's Chuck there who, who uh, makes the wheels go round for that team. It wouldn't be there without Chuck and uh, and all the all the guys on the team. I mean, one of the big things this year with developing the the bike is you've got to be on the track. You know, you can't have silly problems, and 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 the technicians um, have just done, you know, a fantastic job for us. So, yeah, I just want to give a shout out to all the guys and girls at Westby Racing, and uh, especially to Trig. And uh, yeah, we look forward to next year. See how we do. That's great. Thank you, Ed. Thanks for your time. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. All right. Have a good day. Cheers on you.